Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hello, and welcome to another episode of APM Success. Today, I'm going to talk about pain practice launching, looking at two specific operational variables and giving you a KPI, key performance indicator, to figure out how you stack up in these areas. If you can thoroughly address these two areas through the business plan that you construct when you're commencing the practice launch process, then you can be confident you're starting on a solid foundation. Furthermore, understanding the way that you relate to these two variables in any geographic locale, in any specific set of variables that you're considering uh, with all the other things that go into starting a practice, it so often deal breaking challenges boil down to one of these two things and it's patient volume and contracted reimbursement rates. So first patient volume, you obviously need to see enough patients in a short enough amount of time to be financially viable as a medical practice. Um, It depends on your staffing model and clinic setup many other variables, what quote unquote enough patient encounters, what enough patient procedures looks like. But you've got to know that the patient throughput is a critical part of the path to practice management success. And specifically, like, how are you going to get sufficient patient throughput to be paying your bills in a hopefully short amount of time? That is public enemy number one for a practice launcher or for a new um, independent practitioner. So understanding You know, you're not, you got to sort of take off your clinician hat and put on your, what we would call in business parlance, the business development hat. Think about what are the key drivers to take you from zero new patients per week to five to 10 and beyond. New patients in a medical practice are a key leading indicator for trailing financial performance. What I mean is if you want to know how a practice is going to do in the next three or six months, one of the important things you need to look at is, well, how many new patients are coming in the door? Because those new patients are going to represent a number of follow-up visits. And you can base a lot of uh, you know, f- important business decisions around the new patient volume. If you have good new patient volume, then there's a lot of revenue sort of embedded in that that will manifest <clears throat> down the line. If you have insufficient new patient volume, then there's that's really your your biggest problem <laughs> is there's not enough new patients. Um, related, as we think about the new patient volume, new patients per week or per month, there is some variability in this, but knowing what is the baseline average revenue for a new patient. Every time a new patient walks in the door, on average, how many dollars over the lifetime of that patient and the course of their treatments can you expect in your practice? Um, Some physicians will bristle at this because they don't like thinking about a new patient walking in the door and seeing a dollar sign over that patient's head. But the fact is you need to understand this as a good business owner, as a good private practitioner, if you're going to make it in your practice. So what is the average revenue associated with each new patient? If you have no idea, talk to your office manager, talk to your billing team about running reports to generate this intel. And here's why it matters. With patient volume, the necessity to have sufficient patient volume, and the dollars per patient, we're going to make important decisions about how to allocate your marketing dollars based on the answers to these questions. How much can we spend and get break even? Meaning if a new patient on average results in $2,000 of revenue to the practice over time, We just found our max spend for marketing efforts. I would be willing to spend up to $2,000 as a doctor in order to get $2,000 of revenue down the line. Now, obviously, we want to do better than dollar for dollar because break even doesn't make us money. We need to have a multiple of profitability in our marketing spend. But if I spend, for example, $15,000 on marketing last month and it brought me 10 new patients at $2,000 per patient, I spent 15 that brought me cumulatively $20,000 over the course of those treatments for those patients. So there's positive ROI there. 
Again, I'm not super stoked about spending 15 to get 20 over 6 or 12 months, because remember, those dollars are spread out. It's not about uh, $2,000 the first day that patient walks in the door. It's over the course of treatment, uh, over a number of months. So that's starting point, though. And what we can then do is work to refine that. Eventually, as you get deeper into marketing and understanding driving new patient volume, you can get to a point where you say, what kind of new patients do I want? You can isolate more targeted marketing strategies that attract higher per patient revenue for patients needing, for example, particular procedures. Um, I've talked to a number of consultants, healthcare marketing folks, et cetera, that can do this with varying levels of success. And once you understand some of these basic numbers of revenue per patient, revenue per ideal patient with that sort of procedure that is something you're uniquely suited to provide in your geographic locale, that is a nice revenue event and is profitable for your practice, targeting those patients is one way to take a step towards improved profitability. So the point is, if you know your new patient or per patient revenue, then you can buy your way, quote unquote, buy your way to volume. If we say volume is a key variable, we've got to have patient volume if we're going to have success, then you can buy your way there via marketing spend. And in the context of a practice launch, this often means building in marketing budget in the initial loan that you're getting from the bank and being able to get a running start with a good website and maybe some targeted campaigns uh, that will drive potential new patients to your website and be able to convert some of those patients. So spending your way to volume is one way to do this and understanding revenue per patient allows you to do that in a, an informed way. Other ways of driving patient volume are the basics, you know, doing lunch and learns with local care providers, talking about the scope of treatments that you can provide and the care continuum, especially for physicians I mean, A, physicians in your specialty who aren't trained in more advanced procedures that may see value in those and don't have time to get training and don't care to, they can be a referral source. And I've seen circumstances where that happens. You might think, oh, one pain doc won't refer to another. But that's not always true. Um, secondly, just doctors on either side of the care continuum, um, you know, the orthopedic surgeons and the spine and um, neurospine on one hand. <laughs> and then on the other hand, you got the family med and the um, PT and the chiropractors, etc. So thinking about, um, and, and this is one of these other things like, oh, med school doesn't teach doctors this, but there's a, a mindset shift that needs to happen for a physician who's going to do this successfully. And I would encourage you like literally put this on your calendar. You've identified new patient volume as a key driver of your success. The biggest barrier to new patient volume is not a lot of people know about you. So one thing you can do that is measurable is number of doors that you knock on for physicians that should be aware of your services, but aren't, um, and literally block out a day on your calendar. So if Wednesday and Thursdays are clinic days and Friday morning is your procedure slot, like every Tuesday from nine to five, block it out, send your kids to daycare, you know, what, like at, treat it like a normal work day and then make a list of all the places you need to go, the doors you need to knock on, don the white coat, show up at the front desk and say, Hey, I'm here to see Dr. Smith. I'm, you know, a new care provider in town. I want to describe how my services may be a fit. We may be able to partner in some way and how I'm going to take awesome care of these patients, etc. Showing up in person to do that. There, there's no substitute for that. So put it on your calendar, do it every week until you have sufficient new patient volume. The sooner you're able to have this mindset shift of, uh, on one hand, we can push things out onto the internet and hope that that works. And in some cases it can, and that can be sufficient. But when you have more time and less patience, <laughs> the way to change that ratio is to put time on your calendar to generate new patient referrals via these conversations with physicians. So that is the first key variable that you need to understand is patient volume and ways to improve it and why it's critical. The second is contracts. So volume and contracts, this is like the one-two punch of practice success. And by contracts, I mean reimbursement on a per procedure, per e &M code basis from the big payers, Medicare and the commercials. And 
It's important for an independent practitioner to understand the path to credentialing with payers. It will take months. There are um, a lot of hurdles, a lot of paperwork, and it just, it takes way longer than you think it should. And you should prepare for that, prepare accordingly. There are a few rules of thumb, although this, everything I'm going to say varies widely by geography, but there are a lot of places where payer panels are closed, meaning you go to the big carriers, Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Anthem, um, and you say, hey, I'm here. I, uh, I want to start seeing your patients. What can you do for me in terms of reimbursement? Not only are they not going to give you a bad, I mean, not, they're not, it's not that they're not going to give you a good rate. They're just not going to give you any rate. You're going to be out of network. And so um, there are specific ways to address that, but you do need a plan and you do need to know, like, am I going to be in network or out of network? Are there certain geographic locales in which I will literally never be able to be in network with commercial payers? If that's the case, then you need um, a specific strategy to address that. You either need to join something like an MSO or a bigger group uh, where you can perhaps act as a quasi-independent practitioner. You're running your own profit and loss. You've got your own revenue, your own costs, your own profitability, and you're essentially borrowing the tax ID number of that practice who perhaps already has established contracts with the, the payers in question. Sometimes that is a way around that. Uh, or, you know, you can develop a more like cash pay, out of network, concierge medicine type of strategy, serving a patient population where that can work. Um, it's important to find some way around. And if you can't, then that means you need to practice medicine somewhere else, or you need to practice medicine as an employed physician, which is fine. It's good to know what you're getting into and definitely answer this question before you go and take out a $2 million practice loan and rent space. And you, you're putting all these big building blocks into place and financially committing it. You really do need to understand the reimbursement piece. And if you're never going to get the wheels off the runway, like if you're just, if it's a non-starter, then this is something you need to know in advance. And there are consultants and other people that can help you scientifically address and approach this. And sometimes word of mouth is sufficient as well. If you know what zip code you're going to be in, then you can get a lay of the land as far as how reimbursement is going to look and the availability of spots on payer panels. So that's number one under the contracts section, which is if panels are closed, you got to figure out something else. Uh, number two, in terms of reimbursement, you're going to get a certain amount of reimbursement per procedure, per patient encounter. And Medicare is the baseline. Um, Medicare rates are set by CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and commercial payers generally will fall as a either a multiple or a fraction of Medicare, depending on what they feel like paying you and depending on some objective criteria and some pre-existing relationships and many other variables, geography, etc. Um, good commercial contracts will be a multiple of Medicare, and in many cases, practice can't... <laughs> continue to persist in independent practice land without commercial payers sort of subsidizing the whole process just because uh, it's a long story, but related to politics and declining reimbursement and the physician fee schedule, et cetera. But the point is good commercial contracts are going to be 120 to 100%, 180% of Medicare. Some are more. Um, if you're, if you're in a, a very um, competitive area or you have, if it's a very you know, crowded space in terms of physicians in your specialty, uh, then it will, it may be significantly less. And you might be looking at fraction of Medicare rather than multiple of Medicare. Um, my friend, Tina Rivenbark, a uh, practice consultant extraordinaire has this great analogy where she says, if you're buying watermelons for a dollar and selling watermelons for a dollar, the last thing in the world you need is more watermelons. You need to be able to create profitability on a per patient basis. And if your, um, if your reimbursement is insufficient to do that, and by the way, I would say Medicare is kind of like, uh, Medicare is sufficient in an office-based pain practice. And if you have a surgery center, uh, there can be more upside there. Uh, once you get into fraction of Medicare territory, you need a good business plan to make it work. And you're approaching not having financial viability if you're operating primarily at a fraction of Medicare. So again, understanding on a unit revenue basis, meaning per patient, how much revenue can I expect and what 
percentage of Medicare is that? Is it 120% for the CPT code or is it uh, 75% for the CPT code? There's a huge difference in those numbers and a huge difference in your trajectory of viability as a, an independent private practitioner. So understanding the reimbursement and understanding the, um, the likely pro forma you're going to experience based on the reimbursement rates that are going to be available to you as a percentage of Medicare is really some of the basic blocking and tackling. In addition, related to contracts, you need to understand the site of service dynamic, the facility fee, facility reimbursement. And if you have a surgery center, you need to understand how your reimbursement and compensation changes based on where you provide services. Um, there are a lot of cases in which if you're not a non-owner in an ASC, you get, you know, if you do something in your clinic, you get the global fee for that procedure. If you do something in a surgery center, there's the physician work component, and then there's the overhead and malpractice component. So there's the three factor RVU calculation that's getting calculated in the ASC. If you're a non-owner, all you're getting is the physician work RVU component. So in many cases, you might find that by working in the ASC, you're actually decreasing your revenue per patient encounter or per procedure in this case, uh, because of the way the facility reimbursement works. Now, when you're a partner in a surgery center, it's different, but understanding this dynamic and this shift in the way that you think about revenue per patient as it relates to office versus ASC, and it's all tied in with per patient reimbursement, really, really important to understand this, especially before significantly financially committing to a practice launch. So these are uh, some of the important things to think about as you're, if, if you're out there and you're considering an independent practice launch and you're building a business plan, think about these two variables um, and how do you stack up? How does your plan address them? Where is your patient volume going to come from? And what kind of contracts can you expect in your geographic locale? And if you have a good plan to get volume and you have reasonable expectation of Medicare or better reimbursement, then you have a fair uh, expectation of success. If either one of those components is missing, you need to go back to the drawing board and figure out a plan to either um, address that shortcoming and make it no longer insufficient in the geographic locale that you're considering, or consider launching somewhere else where these variables are going to be more favorable. That's all I've got for this week. Hopefully this has been insightful and I look forward to chatting with you again soon. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.